Welcome to Nature Revisited. On this episode, we are going to visit with Joel Fry, the curator of Bartram's Garden, which is situated on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. History has a way of remembering and forgetting historical places. Most of us know of Jefferson's Monticello and Washington's Mount Vernon, and many have visited these historical sites, which are surrounded by beautiful landscapes. But Bartram's garden, not so much. This historical garden, started by John Bartram during the colonial period, which is now nestled in the urban landscape of Philadelphia, has at times been completely forgotten. But more recently, Bartram's garden has been making its way back to its historical significance and important horticultural contributions. But Bartram's garden isn't just about the past. They are developing new ways of connecting people with nature. Programs like the one that brings city kids to Bartram's garden so that they can be exposed to the natural world. Recently, I visited Bartram's garden and sat down with Joel Fry. So we're sitting in John Bartram's new flower garden. This was, this was one of his gardens, but we haven't done anything to restore it yet. In many ways, John Bartram was the most important gardener in America in the 18th century. He started a lot of current themes in gardening, discovered a lot of the plants of North America. He was a Pennsylvania Quaker. He was born near this garden site in Darby, Pennsylvania. His grandparents had been immigrants under William Penn when William Penn first uh, was given deed to the tract of Pennsylvania. So he grew up in a Quaker household. Quakers in the 17th and 18th century were very attuned to nature. They may, may not have used the word nature, but they saw God in everything, in people and in animate and inanimate things. So Quaker children were often brought up to revere nature and to study plants. And also Quakers had a fondness for uh, plant medicines as well. So John Bartram seems to have gotten into studying plants because he was interested in medicine. He must have learned something about plant medicines as a young boy because by the time he's an adult, he's well respected as a kind of herbal healer. And that's only one of the many things he does. But he may have first begun looking at plants around him for those useful medicinal purposes. Did he choose his location or was his location in the family, so to speak? No, so he chose this location. So that's another thing is that he grows up in Darby. His grandfather had a roughly a 300 acre farm, one of these original farms, which is just a rectangular tract uh, that went over several creek valleys. Uh, actually part of that tract is still open as a cemetery now, which is interesting. So you can see where the farm John Bartram grew up on. Um, he, in his early life, he has troubles. His mother dies when he's two or three. His father dies when he's 11 in, in North Carolina in an Indian war. So he's an orphan by 11. But when he turns 21, he inherits his grandfather's farm in Darby. So he's kind of well set at a young age. He marries, his first wife dies. So that's when he comes here. He He's restarting his life after he's a widower with one young son. And he seems to have chosen this site particularly because the site of his garden is a very good natural garden site. It's uh, sheltered by little hills to the north and south. It faces southeast. It's on a series of terraces that drop from about 70 feet above sea level down to the Schuylkill, which is tidal. And where those terraces dropped, there were natural springs that kind of trickled. So it was a well-watered garden in a time when they didn't have um, hydraulic pressure or plumbing or any way of watering except hauling it or natural watering. So uh, he seems to have scoped out this site. All we can figure out is that he came here on purpose uh, he may not have really thought of it being a nursery, but he probably thought it, he was going to collect plants for himself. He's already been getting a reputation as a plant healer or an herbalist in a way. So he may have thought more it would be a place he could grow things he wanted. We only have one good plan or image of the garden in John Bartram's life that lays it out. His son, William Bartram, made this drawing in 1758. And it shows pretty much the same framework of paths we have today in this garden. But half of the whole eight or 10 acres is a vegetable garden. So a large part of it early on was just kitchen garden produce. And maybe some of it was big fields of, you know, quarter acre of cabbages or turnips or something that wouldn't be very interesting to us. 
but then he also had his collections. And on the terrace right in front of the house where we're sitting, that's where he had his special gardens. There were gardens up here that were fenced off. And in that 1758 drawing, they're given names. We're sitting in the new flower garden. In the center was something called the common flower garden, which sounds like it was the more you know usual everyday garden. And then again, there's a, a kitchen garden piece up here. One thing about Bartram's and the Bartram family is we often talk about John Bartram, but it's an entire family enterprise. So the kitchen gardens may have been partly under his wife Anne Bartram's control, and that would have been typical in colonial you know, farm households. His children certainly also worked in the garden. His children went on collecting trips with him as they became you know, teenagers, they would often go. And eventually it's one of his sons, William Bartram, who goes most often with his father on very long trips to the Catskills twice, to New England, down to the Carolinas. Uh, and eventually even to Florida. So the son, William Bartram, in a second generation, becomes very famous as a collector, really doing the same thing his father did. Uh, and so, yeah, so there are multiple generations working in the garden, and they continue it through three generations. So this became a very important garden site from roughly 1728, when John Bartram uh, arrives here, up until 1850, through three generations of the Bartrams. And each of those generations added new plants, and Partly because the collection was here, people visited to see it. Uh, and Philadelphia at one point was the capital of the US in the revolutionary period and then thereafter. So uh, European naturalists, European political figures, ambassadors, you know, the early presidents all come here. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Madison. The Constitutional Convention uh, takes a Saturday break to come and visit a number of the delegates come here and wander through the garden. So this. Also, we're in the city of Philadelphia right now. We're in a very urban part, very industrial surrounding the site, everywhere you look. But in John Bartram's life and in the historic period, this garden was out in the country. It was a, you know, a rural farmstead about six miles from the urban part of the city. So this was a way to get out of the you know, hustle and bustle and smell of an 18th century city and go out into the country. And even to this day, this is a very beautiful site. This ridge above the river amazingly has been preserved. And, just the preservation of the site is a whole nother story, but the fact that it's preserved means you have this piece of landscape that you wouldn't have any other way. And it preserves this, you know, incredible vistas of the river and the, the modern city behind us. Why do you think it fell off the radar screen, so to speak? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so John Bartram is well known in his lifetime. Actually, when he dies, he may have been the second most famous Philadelphian after Benjamin Franklin, and again, John Bartram was good friends with Franklin. A lot of what Franklin does early on, he gets credit as being the inventor of all kinds of things, streetlights, fire companies. Uh, in some ways, it's almost a joke that Franklin invented everything in Philadelphia. But when you really look at it, he's part of a committee of people. Uh, he, he's a very active advocate for doing all these improving things, but many people involved. So John Bartram was one of the people that was you know, always connected with Franklin. Modern historians like to simplify things. It's easier to cut down the number of people in the past. So over time, John Bartram kind of gets cut out. And he's not what is often taught in American history, which is lists of presidents' names or wars and generals. You know, he's not involved in any of that for the most part. Uh, so he's kind of, in, in one way, just a gardener, someone who loves plants, but he's also a scientist, an early kind of scientist. But even modern biologists and scientists don't quite understand historic science. It doesn't seem science-y like enough. It's not rigorous like they want. Uh, uh, and only now, actually, with the internet, a lot of documents appear that we never knew existed in places. And people have been photographing plant collections in Europe. So a lot of the early Bartram specimens are now available. And even for the first time, we can look at them. And even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had access or even known what was in those collections. So yeah, this is a kind of unique colonial garden because it's so large. It's, most people had very small kitchen gardens. They grew vegetables, uh, you know, cabbages, turnips, a little bit of sweet corn, maybe some beans. Uh, nobody, for the most part, collected ornamental trees or shrubs until maybe the last quarter of the 18th century, for the most part. So Bartram's doing something very different. And partly the only reason he could make such a large garden was because of the support he got from these Europeans. So the thing is, if you look at botanic gardens, official botanic gardens, they're often institutions founded by universities or medical schools. European botanic gardens usually have some kind of nobility or royal patronage. You know, they're often called the Royal Botanic Garden in Italy or Spain or England. So Bartram is kind of unique because maintaining that kind of a garden uh, and the wide variety of plants requires an awful lot of labor. At its peak, we know this garden had something like 12 full-time gardeners. 
that's in the 1830s, but John Bartram and his wife Anne had nine children. So in fact, they're part of the labor force who could work in the garden when they were young. And interestingly, all the Bartram children also go into professions kind of related around gardening. Two of them stay here and actually run the garden for another generation. But uh, it was really that European funding, you know, that transformed what Bartram could do. Uh, so what Bartram is doing uh, and the wide range traveling is something that no one else was doing. In fact, it's very unique in America at that time. So Bartram goes from New England down to Florida, much, much wider range, and manages to bring back an awful lot of plants too. And, and the whole idea of how he gets the plants back here when he's traveling, I mean, he's mostly traveling with one or two people, with one or two horses. Even at the time Bartram is first starting this work in the 1730s, the area right around Philadelphia had already been largely cleared and cultivated as farms. So early on, Bartram takes a trip up the Schuylkill River, which is the river right in front of his doorstep, up to its headwaters. And on that trip, he finds rhododendrons. He finds the first evergreen rhododendrons ever in cultivation in the English world. He's then calling them great laurel or mountain laurel, They're this big evergreen laurel-like plant he finds up in the mountains. And he, when he finds them, they probably were in bloom when he saw them. So he, the next year, he says he took a couple hands in a canoe and went up the river and brought back six or seven plants. And that's just one example. So if you start looking at Bartram, it's overwhelming how many plants he actually cultivated and described. Lots of plants that no, no one even grows in gardens now. Bartram experimented with these rare Pine Barrens plants. And eventually some of those became kind of like the stock of the Bartram family garden here over multiple generations. So plants like Turkey Beard and Swamp Pink, uh, some of which are, are almost endangered plants now, the Bartrams grew. You know, ladies tresses orchids, uh, crested orchids, yellow crested orchid, white crested orchid. So interesting things. And then some of the more common American wildflowers, things like oh, spring beauties and rudbeckias and uh, echinacea, uh, which Bartram just called probably the red rudbeckia. It didn't even it didn't have the name uh, echinacea. So one thing in researching the Bartrams that we've had to do in recent years is figure out what the plants are from his descriptions and his names because they're not our modern names. One thing that happened in the midst of John Bartram's early career is that Linnaeus suddenly appeared on the scene as well. And Linnaeus was this Swede who gets a medical degree in Amsterdam and develops this new system of studying nature, what's called the System Natura. That's published in Amsterdam or Leiden in the 1736. And Within a year, there's a copy in Philadelphia, and we know John Bartram was reading it, and he starts doing Linnaean uh, botany, he, and he begins sending things through various routes to Linnaeus. It was always difficult to get letters from Philadelphia to Sweden because there was no direct trade, but through Collinson, through people in the Netherlands, Bartram sent lots of material to Linnaeus. I mean, was this like the first American nursery? So yeah, nurseries are not common at all in the colonial period, say before the American Revolution. There really are almost no commercial nurseries to speak of. Often there's a farmer who might specialize in fruit trees, maybe who knows apples or has a, a wide collection of grafted apples and you might go to him to get grafting stock to graft your own apples. So John Bartram is unique. And I think early on his garden begins as his garden. And that to some extent is why this site is still called Bartram's garden. It's, you know, it's, it's John Bartram's garden. After the revolution, it becomes a much more formal thing. And his sons really do, they publish catalogs right away as soon as the revolution is over. And then people know that this is a place you can come. We also think then they also have large nursery grounds where they might have 30 you know, rhododendrons and 30 Mount Laurels and a, a number of um, you know, ornamental trees as well, like a modern nursery. Eventually, by the beginning of the 19th century, you know, we know they're officially a nursery. They begin advertising in newspapers. They publish bigger and bigger catalogs. Uh, because again, the, the Bartrams always knew, even through all three generations, their major clients were Europeans who wanted and would pay large amounts of money for American plants. Lots of Americans knew if they wanted Amer American trees, they could just go out in the woods and find them. It grows by kind of accretion over time to become a nursery and become a place to come and probably certain times of the year, like this time of year, early spring, people come to see the you know, flush of blooms. And the thing about the trade is Bartram is sending all this American material to Collinson, but Collinson is replying with all the plants he has in his garden. And so this would have been a place to see all the garden flowers of Europe. And many of those plants weren't in America anywhere else. So, you know, varied tulips. Bartram has one of the biggest collections of tulips. And as he travels, sometimes he'll 
make friends and send them collections of plants and seeds and bulbs, you know, special things. And so where we have those lists of what he's sending other people, we can kind of figure out those are some of the special things he had. Was there any public gardens in the colonial landscape, do you think? Very rare. Uh, so Philadelphia, not really until after the revolution, there were really no public gardens. It's interesting. So William Penn laid out a very famous plan for the city of Philadelphia that had five big public squares that now exist and are parks, or to some extent parks in the city of Philadelphia. But in the colonial world, they had abandoned those squares completely. They used them as public burial grounds or public grazing tracks, but they weren't gardens in any sense. And they eventually were kind of places of ill repute. You didn't want to go there. They hung people in one of the public squares. This garden, I think the Bartrams probably during normal hours welcomed people that showed up. But again, because they're not quite in the urban city, they weren't harangued with hundreds of people. Other colonies, like Virginia, had no real public parks. Boston had a common, but I'm not sure how much that was a park until much, much later. So the concept of parks just didn't exist in most American cities. So again, this park was largely sort of ignored for close to 100 years. The, the city preserved it in the 1890s, but it really wasn't until the 1980s that you know gardening kind of returned here. There, were, there was nothing you would really call a garden here until actually a, a very small garden was laid out during the bicentennial by volunteer women from garden clubs. There were trees here, there was a large collection of trees, but actually people in the period of the 1890s until maybe the 1970s thought of this more as an arboretum. They thought John Bartram collected trees, you know, and didn't really think of it as a garden, even though it's always been called a garden. Another thing is because the site, the area around it became so industrial, it wasn't such a pleasant place to visit in uh, this site gets preserved as a park in 1891 after a long fight, about a decade fight to get it preserved with laws passed in city council in Philadelphia. But that same time period, the area around it, what we call the Lower Schuylkill in Philadelphia, became very industrialized, mostly petrochemical industry, oil refineries, oil storage, uh, railroad yards for shipping oil, and the river became incredibly foul. It was covered with oil slicks, it burned. It was also an open sewer, so all the sewage of the city was dumped in it. So this was not a pleasant place to come in the summer. And one change that's happened actually since the 70s with the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts is the Lower Schuylkill has come back to life. So the birds have returned, uh, the fish have returned. Uh, we even get bald eagles flying over this site, which you know, when I was a child, I never saw a bald eagle anywhere. They were thought to be close to extinction. How do you see that this garden and the history of this is still very relevant for today? Yeah, I, I, I would say there's a lot of reasons. And again, because I love gardens, I mean, I like historic gardens anywhere. I, I like all the open parkland in the city and, you know, but uh, so there, I, I think there are a lot of things you can get from here. One is that it's just keeping this tradition. So the fact that this place was a garden for so long and it's still a garden, and, you know, is a place where all these historic figures once walked, you know, Jefferson, Franklin, Washington, the Bartrams, uh, and a range of people from, you know, scientists who most Americans don't know these European or American plant scientists who came here, but you know, they know Audubon. So Audubon was here, uh, but it's also a living garden. So gardens are something that change every year and they require human care and tending the plants. The fact that we have people doing the same thing that the Bartrams did on a very small scale, we on a very small scale go out and collect seeds of some American plants because some of the plants the Bartrams grew aren't commercially grown by anybody. You know, they're a lot of very obscure and even weedy things the Bartrams grew and Sometimes we just go out and find some of that and grow them ourselves. But that experience of starting seeds, growing them, and, you know, and then seeing them flower is, is a interesting continuation. And it's this ancient human thing. I mean, humans have been doing that since they became humans and first began growing or even observing plants in the wild. So I think that's valuable. I think it's different for all the people that visit. There are, as I said, these different audiences we have, uh, people who just want a pleasant place to walk in the spring, people who want to know about history, people who know a lot about plants and know that this is where a certain plant may have first been grown. So one thing we talk, often look into is, is the whole term of nature. When does that become a concept? Uh, the Bartrams have a concept of nature early on, but I don't know whether, William definitely uses that term in his book, but whether they meant exactly what we mean by nature is a question as well. I think if you presented it to him, he would understand that though, the, this concept of, because that to some extent is what he was doing. He's, he's raising a garden here where, you know, he's working with the plants on a daily basis. Actually, that, that's another thing is that he and his whole family are out here working on a daily basis. And 
one of the interesting thing is when when wealthy Europeans and Americans come here after the revolution, they're usually somewhat aghast to find the Bartrams out digging, you know, you know, often they'll say, I found William Bartram barefoot digging in the mud, you know, wearing a leather apron or something. Wealthy Europeans don't expect the owner of a garden to be actually digging. And even Jefferson rarely actually gardened himself. He told other people what to do. So they're always in the mud here, but then they're also out in nature finding things and kind of glorying in the whole concept. I, I think both the first John Bartram and William appreciated that they had a special life that they could go out and see these wild lands at a time. You know, there's, there's very little real wild land on the East Coast, if any, maybe there's none, depending on your definition of it. Maybe there's some small pockets here and there. Uh, and, and even John and William Bartram mentioned the decline of nature around them. So John Bartram in his later career says, plants I used to be able to get within a half an hour's ride from my farm, I have to go 30 miles, 60 miles, into the far back country because they plowed everything up and planted corn where the plants once grew. And in their time, no one had the sense of preserving nature in the slightest and, you know, but they are one of the few people to realize that nature was already being destroyed or changed. And the other thing is that John Bartram being a Pennsylvania Quaker knew that there were native populations as well in North America. So when he travels, He's often on the forefront of the frontier, right where you know native lands are being sold or acquired by one means or another, legally or illegally. He wouldn't just wander off into the Iroquois country because he knew it was dangerous, or yeah, you know, without permission from the Iroquois, you could be easily killed. Uh, and he always had this fear of Indians. But so anyway, he's on that real frontier area where he sees the land, and maybe there's one or two farmers, you know, chopping down trees and clearing a five-acre or ten-acre tract. He travels an area where there are no colonists, and within 25 years, there's a population of five, six, seven thousand on the Lehigh River on the Susquehanna. Um, so he often almost laments the the loss of, of some of his favorite plant collection sites. It's kind of intriguing. It's a it's a good concept for the Bartrams again because that's what they're doing more than almost anyone else because they're actually going out to find interesting new plants that may have a commercial use or may have some use. They may. And the uses are variable. They may be just attractive. So a lot of the plants Bartram sells to the Europeans, it's because they're attractive. Flowering shrubs, you know, azaleas, rhododendrons. They might be medicinal plants. John Bartram is always still looking for new medicinal plants, but they're out in the wild, it's kind of selecting what might be interesting in a garden. And again, that's a time, a little bit that still goes on. There are still people out collecting plants, finding new varieties in the wild. Uh, but we often think of gardens as separate from nature completely. Yeah, I mean, gardens are something humans control and you buy your plants at the Home Depot or Lowe's and there's no connection to nature, but that, yeah. So uh, your idea that gardens and nature are intertwined makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about you a little bit. Um, what brought you to Bartram's garden? I had always had an interest in gardens. My father grew up on a farm outside of Philadelphia. So when I was very young, I often spent you know, multiple weekends on a farm that was then a very typical Pennsylvania farm. It had dairy cattle, it grew wheat, uh, it had a little orchard, it had chickens. And my grandmother would give me plants and I would grow plants. So I, I liked gardening in an amateur way, but never really studied it other than your typical high school biology or something like that. I was here when I was in high school a very long time ago for one day in 1975. Uh, but then in 1980, I was here for excavations over about a five month period. And then I, then I went off and did other things. I did archeology span all over the place, uh, but came back here about 1990, uh, first as a consultant, and then they finally decided they needed more information. So I you know, became curator in 92. So I've been here pretty much all the time since about 1992. We did some archeology span here in 1980. Actually in this garden we're sitting in right now, the new flower garden, we found evidence of garden beds. We found a little piece of one of the original walks. Uh, mostly we found much later evidence though. So the later generations did so much more alteration of the landscape. We found greenhouses, 19th century greenhouses, big buildings that were 60 or 75 feet long. And we found thousands of flower pots. I mean, we found literally close to 10,000 flower pot fragments uh, excavating two or three greenhouses. Uh, so that got me interested in what were they growing in all these flower pots and I began doing research but no one had really studied the plant collection or the depth of the plant collection here. So I began looking at the Bartram catalogs and trying to figure out what the plants were. And the, the Bartrams seem to have clearly had an eye for rare plants. Often wherever they travel, they find what is still now the rarest plant in that location. Uh, 
uh, uh, plants on the verge of extinction. Their most famous plant, Franklinia, is now extinct in the wild. It was only found in one place in South Georgia, but they happened to see it in that trip. So one of our big challenges has been to change perceptions. This garden, actually, the, our visit, visitation has increased dramatically for a number of reasons lately. So one is that it is just this little preserved jewel, this little green oasis here along the lower river. Partly industry is leaving Philadelphia, has been for 25 or 30 years. So a lot of industrial tracks surrounding us have been shut down and they're just open fields now. Philadelphia, like a lot of urban kind of Rust Belt East Coast cities, went through a big decline in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, but now is kind of reviving, populations increasing, lots of young people are coming. We're in an area where they're now building bicycle trails, so we're being connected into the main part of the city. So people come out here because they've heard the name Bartram now. So for, for quite a long time, for close to 100 years, people had forgotten the name Bartram. But now we're kind of becoming known as a place that knows about plants. We now have a large staff that works here doing different things. We do a lot of education programs with the local children. Uh, yeah, we get funding so local uh, Philadelphia school kids can come on field trips here. They don't normally go on field trips anywhere. In the last five years, we've developed an urban farm in the southern part of the park. So we have two farmers who work through the education program of the University of Pennsylvania, and they raise a whole range of crops, often some heirloom vegetable varieties, uh, African-American vegetables. They have a range of interns who are local high school students who work in the summer to maintain the farm, and they teach nutrition, preparing food. Uh, from. So in some ways, we're a kind of center of knowledge, I guess you could say. That's one thing we do about plants. So people come here for many reasons. That's another thing is that, you know, we often we try to think of what's our audience and we don't have a single key audience. We have maybe five or six that overlap in certain ways, but there are people who come here to look at birds. There are people who come here because it's quiet away from the urban city. There are people who just like to watch the river or people who fish. There are people who know about plants and like plants and come here to see, you know, the seasonal different kinds of plants. and. We have some interesting rare plants, but if you don't know where to look, you might not even see them if you just walk quickly through. I would say one of the reasons everyone likes this place is there still is this sense it's a garden, even when it was really bedraggled and overgrown and forgotten. People would come here and go, wow, this is a kind of a neat place. And often, even to this day, native Philadelphians often don't know this place. But when they come here, everyone, like people who deliver packages here or people who get lost and come here by accident go, wow, what is this place? I didn't know this was here. I hope you enjoyed my visit with Joel Fry. And if you would like to learn more about John Bartram and Bartram's Garden, please visit bartramsgarden.org. If you happen to be in the great city of Philadelphia, I recommend a visit to Bartram's Garden. In the meantime, Please share this podcast with friends and family and continue to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Please join us again for the next episode of Nature Revisited, the podcast. And remember, we are nature. <laughs>